Hey guys, this is the bagel workflow. I got bored one day and I put everything on a bagel. Everything. I'm making this video for three main reasons. The first one is that all of us that use Confi UI are pretty much converging on one way of doing things ish when it comes to the traditional, you know, TikTok movement capture to say background replacement while keeping the camera motion smooth, uh, reintegration of the character, uh, prompt traversal, uh, face changing. We're, we're all using the same tools. And at this point, it's really the parameters, right? What you pass to say reactor and so on. How much weight you give to say the control nets over there, which are daisy chained together. You know, how much weight do you give those? Uh, which ones do you use in which context? That's what really makes the difference today. The other reason I make this video is quite frankly, a little bit out of frustration. I read the comments on a lot of these videos. I find they divided into two parts. There's some fantastic content creator out there, Latent Vision, that's Mateo's channel. If you don't know it, go check it out. Is the inventor of IP adapter. He makes the best video on the topic on YouTube. There's also Fernical Sticks. He's an amazing content creator. Go check him out too. Unfortunately, if I scroll down, I'm going to find some videos I don't really like. And I'll tell you why, because these guys tell you, go and download my workflow that just happens to sit on a paywall and they ask for money. And that's really disgusting because we're in a space where everything we do depends on GitHub and fantastic developers like Kosi Kading. Kosi, sorry, I keep messing up his name, but you know what I mean? The creator of Animate Diff. Uh, this guy is an absolute superstar. He's got a Patreon. You really want to spend some money? I tell you what, go give him some money because he deserves it. He's basically making all of this possible for us. He's just released. And this is the third point as to why I'm making this video. This stuff moves so fast. Two days ago, he's released the Gen 2 of his animated diff nodes. As you can see, it can get quite complex and sometimes a little bit intimidating. So I want to go and take you through my workflow, which I think is pretty much... Well, the, the standard at this point, I've, I've taken the best bits of all sorts of workflows. I've integrated them into a giant end-to-end -end workflow that takes a source of movement or multiple source of movements um, that segments them uh, using Coco and then reintegrates them with a prompt traversal into something that's going to be coherent so the image doesn't break down as you animate it and gives you a little bit of visual feedback here. Um, as well as face replace. I mean, you name it, it's in there. And the output looks a bit like this. I think this looks quite decent. You can see the shadows. It's been relit properly. If we change the background to a night one, she'll be lit different. Um, and um, yeah, so I wanted to point that out. I had to take down my former video, which was a little bit... Uh, I don't know, a little bit different, I suppose, uh, because of copyright infringement issues. Sorry about that, Paris, Texas. I love you as a band. I'm sorry I used your music. Anyway, let's get going. So the first thing you're going to notice and probably scream at when you see this workflow is, oh my God, look at all those noodles. Why isn't he using a pipe? Why isn't he using a bus? Extra, extra, extra. Well, I'm very familiar with these tools. The reason I'm doing this is very simple. Let me show you in practical terms what happens if you pass a single frame because you wanted to say, maybe test your uh, sampler. Maybe you wanted to test your scheduler. Uh, well, this type of horror, uh, that's a little bit NSFW for my taste, but anyway, uh, up here. And the reason for that is if we look at Animate Diff, I love those Gen 2 nodes. They're actually properly labeled here. You can see that you load an Animate Diff model, you apply an Animate Diff model, and then Animate Diff uses sampling. Right? So what does that mean? It's actually changing your images, right? And it's trained on a context. That context is 16 frames. If you pass it on a single frame, you end up with those horrors. So why is this noodle soup? How does that explain anything? Well, very simply, let's imagine I wanted to bypass animate diff. All I need to do is locate the model. That's not really hard. I just need to go over there. I find that the model is here. That's why I use the single reroute. By the way, I'm using RG3 reroutes. They're very good. And I would take this and I would pass it there. There you go. So now I'm bypassing animate diff all together. 
And if I queue while I follow the execution, let's see if that's if that's on. Yeah, it should be on. Let's press Q. Bloop. We're gonna extract a single frame segment. Coco. Coco takes a little bit of time because I don't think I have it running over CUDA. Obviously, we have open pose for the control nets. This is a good way also to see what this workflow does. Estimate the pose. Sorry, uh, so this is the other thing is this is taking forever, right? You're noticing that <laughs> just for a single frame. And the reason for that is that this has not arrived yet. This is my new computer. <laughs> it's got a 4090 in there. I'm currently running on a 2080 and yeah, it is extremely slow. This is the other thing. As soon as you start using IP adapter, as soon as you start using Zoe Depth, for example, like I'm using here, you're going to see that it's very slow. Uh, if you don't have a 2080 or 30 something card, I highly recommend you use the cloud. There's various providers. I'm not here to tell you which one to buy. I'm not sponsored by anyone. I don't care. Use whoever you want. Use RunPod, use Think Diffusion, whatever works for you. If you think it's well priced, go for it. But yeah, in a nutshell, uh, what's, what's this is, what this is going to do is allow you to test your sampler and your scheduler and the number of steps on a single frame. Um, and you'll see that the results, once it's finally there, will be fantastically different. That's the IP adapter. Hello, Matteo. Great work, Matteo. Just amazing tool. That's the prompt reversal. And there you go. The case sampler is triggering, finally, I might add. And let's have a look at what uh, the prompt is doing. It's, oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's slow. All right, so it's gonna take two minutes to generate a single frame. Yeah, I, I really need this new computer. Send help, please, as the meme says. Well, the long story short is I'm gonna pause here, wait for it to finish, come back and show you the output result. And it's finished and I was sending it 16 frames. So this is actually a really good example. I'm really happy I made that mistake in a sense. What it shows you is what animate diff actually does. You see the background flipping really quickly. I think I'm at 24 frames per second here. Uh, this type of inconsistency on the building in the background, the clothing, the shoes, the face, although the face is uh, going through reactor, so it's a little bit more stable. I think that's the only stable part of the image. Uh, that's due to the fact I'm bypassing animate diff. But this is why I do what I do. This is why I'm not using those piping nodes just yet when I'm learning, when I'm trying new techniques, because now if I want to revert, and by the way, you can do this while it executes, I simply need to take the model and pass it back to animate diff. So let's do exactly that. Find the model, pass it to animate diff. Here it is. And then take it into free uv2 by the way there's different settings for this i've put it into the note here you can play with those the truth is it's kind of like a seed right a lot of people like to give this impression that they know everything that they have complete control over the image um it's a recurrent theme in our in our little industry here in a little world little community uh the truth is no one knows right um the seed itself and there's a lot of them, as you know, I can, I could randomize it, but I don't want to mess up my cache because it would be another two minute wait. Um, it's going to have a huge, huge, huge amount of uh, impact on the actual results, the clothing, extra. And this is a good time to tell you the, probably the most important lesson to learn about Confi UI and SD type image creation in general. It is a numbers game you're going to be batching a lot. That's why I'm so excited about this new config script uh, note that they have. And the idea is that you're going to be able with config script, you're going to be able to, to code, right? Your workflow. Uh, and in fact, what you can do is you can take your workflow, give it to uh, this node and it's going to spit out some code. So it works both ways and then you can modify it. And you see where this is going? You're going to be able to generate a workflow per scene. And that's maybe the second most important point of this video is people are not using this tool properly. This is a learning tutorial. When you see these mega workflows, they're for learning, learning only. 
in reality, let's take a real movie. I've deconstru deconstructed, pardon me, uh, The Lost Highway by David Lynch. It's it's one of my favorite movies of all times. I hope I don't get copyright striked here again. Uh, but the idea is if you look at just the first minute of this fantastic film, you're going to find that even though it's what's called a, a slow moving film, it's using a lot a lot of different shots and they're all very well thought out. David Lynch is an absolute genius. Everything is composed to perfection and yeah, the fade out, you can do that in Resolve, that's not an issue. So what you need to do is break down it into sequences and for each, you're probably going to have a workflow. And if some of them are identical, like for example, when he takes a cigarette, he does it twice over two different shots. There's also a zoom view of the buzzer. Uh, you should do this into the same workflow, but you're gonna have multi multiple workflow per scene. Now, if you think that's a lot of work, imagine how much work it would be to hire a camera crew, the best actors in the game, and have a fantastic director like David Lynch uh, filming that movie. Considerably more. And I think this is why Confi UI is the future, in my in my opinion. Yes, of course, these tools still look like very much AI generated. Uh, I'm no fool. Uh, you know, this type of effect, right, that looks completely bizarre, where everything morphs and the face isn't right, the clothes are inconsistent. I mean, it's trippy, but it gets boring really quick. That's why people hate it. But thanks to tools like Animate Diff, I'm going to plug it back and you're going to see the difference immediately. And there you go. So I skipped this, of course, because it took another three minutes. Uh, but you can see that the background is now completely steady. In fact, I would say that this point in time, the game, if you want to call it that, in Animate Diff, Confi UI, IP Adapter, Control Nets, you name it, it's about control. Control, you must control. Control. Control, you must learn control. Uh, if you don't have control, this is going to look funky and so on. But you can see that apart from some minor variation around here, and this is really subtle, uh, this is super well, this is tight. This is tight. I know it's not photorealistic. The reason it's not photorealistic is because I'm using a 1.5 model. And again, this is because it's using all my VRAM. Uh, as you can see, even uh, when I'm not running something, I'm at 68% VRAM used. This brings me to a third important point about Confi UI. RAM management at this point in time is not all there. The reason for that is because the nodes that are released at the speed of light Sometimes they're updated every day, every half day. Uh, they're not going in line with the development of Confi UI itself. So obviously the developers of Confi UI are having a little bit of trouble catching up. And when the tool tries to unload, reload, re-reload and so on, different models, caching and, and whatnot, uh, you end up with memory leaks. And then the next thing you know, you gotta go in there and restart the server. And that's a little bit frustrating because if you didn't save the composites image that are used to generate, say, the segmentation, like Zoe, for example, well, you gotta rerun Zoe all over again and we can all agree that that's not great. So in conclusion, and I was touching on those nodes actually a minute ago, um, why am I not using pipes? It's to learn so that you can learn and if you do want to use pipes, I highly recommend you go check out Confi 0246. It's done by a guy called Trung. It's absolutely amazing. Let me show you how good this is. This is just blew my mind when I saw it. First of all, it looks super clean. It's worth using just for this beautify node. This beautify node allows you to dump the JSON from anywhere. So any type is going to be unfolded and you're going to be able to see exactly what's what where. You can then use this as a source of debug information. You can see your tensors. You can use that with the tensor debug uh, that comes with the essential node pack. Just fantastic stuff. But I think where it really shines is in this new node that the creator has, has uh, recently released. It's called the Hub. Now, if we can zoom in on the Hub a little bit, you can see that you can add widgets, you can delete widgets from the control panel. And what that's leading us to is this sort of GUI type approach to Confi UI, people being able to generate their own GUI. And you're, if you're familiar with tools such as, let's go check it out, uh, Open Interpreter, if you're, if you're familiar with that, um, this is a tool that will allow you to use a local LLM 
to interact with your computer, to click buttons, to type code and so on. So put two and two together. Imagine you have Open Interpreter and you got it connected to these new script nodes and you also have access to Trunks node. It means that one day we'll talk to Config UI and it will create the interface for us. This, this is where we're headed, guys. I mean, this is the future. And it's really exciting to be part of that. We're in the very early stages. So anyways, let's go and dig in this workflow and what it does and best practices. So the first thing you need to do is obviously obtain a source uh, of movement. Now I use this TikTok video. I will create it the denser in the description. Always remember that uh, right now the copyright law around this is very loose. People are playing fast and loose, but you should probably take precaution if you're a big business. I know Netflix is hiring Confi UI engineers, believe it or not. Uh, so uh, yeah, copyright is going to be a thing. The reason we need this is for the same reason that guys who make video games or animations or even films in Unreal Engine use these mocap tools. You need the movement. So if you don't have a good source of movement, if you don't want to make a TikTok video, why don't you film yourself? And that will allow you to then animate. And honestly, this is exactly how you should think about it. Think about it like you're in Unreal, you're trying to animate a character, you need a source of movement. How do you do it? You need mocap. It's not gonna be done in a generational way, at least not today, not just yet. I know there's projects like Open Post 3D within Confi, but we're not there yet. So let's go back to our video. Here we extract a number of frames. As I said, 16. 16 is what Animate Diff is trained on. It's optimal. If you want more than 16 frames, let's say we want 32 frames, try to count in 16, okay? It's gonna make your life a lot easier. It's gonna use a lot more RAM because it keeps pass passing the latent to the case sampler in batches of 16. That's a lot of RAM used every time. I think if you have a eight gig of VRAM, maybe you can make a one minute video tops. I mean, it will crash at one point or another. I don't think it's abnormal, it's completely normal. Uh, but yeah, you take that 16 frame and then you need to be absolutely sure in animate diff that you have selected uh, a context option that is in line with that. So the context length is 16, meaning that my 32 frames, they're going to be processed in groups of 16, what it was trained on for optimal results in order to maintain that visual control over the image. And please do go into the documentation and please read about, for example, uh, the source of noise. Free noise was recently released. It's absolutely amazing. It's the de facto standard. So uh, there's also a free iteration option here if you want to play with that. Usually iteration two is optimal. I'm not using it for this video again because of VRAM reason. Just wait till I get my 4090. We'll be having a different conversation. <laughs> so anyways. We got uh, our video, we're extracting 16 frames. Uh, I really recommend that what you do when you play with this type of thing, you use a preview window for everything. Yes, it uses more VRAM, I know, but what it does is allows you to see what you're working from. And you can see the motion blur here. This might be problematic. You can see the clothing is a bit loose. This might be problematic. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to grab the 16 best frame at a time that you can grab. You can skip frames, as I'm sure you know, but that's not really useful. I, I find that a one-to-one -one match for when it comes to motion capture, because that's what we're doing here, is the way to go. So where does this information all go? Let's have a look. Well, it goes to the control net processors. Of course it does. And there's a ton of them. There's a ton of them. This is one called Zoe Depth Anything. As you can see, it's pretty accurate. I quite like this one. Uh, it's not too blurry, but it's a bit blurry. And you'll see that this has a direct impact on the quality of your motion capture. Now, remember, a control net's purpose is to influence the generation. Essentially, it's like a, a super prompt, if you will, right? It's trying to conform 
the latent that's going to be passed to the case sampler to obey what it sees here. What's in white is going to have more importance than what's in black. And of course, that's what we want because we want to grab our arm here that you can barely see, and we want that to be con visually consistent. I mean, even for a human, this is pretty hard to decipher. So for a machine, it's quite hard. So what you do for this is you use multiple type of preprocessor. There's one called Midas, for example. Uh, Midas currently has a bug where the settings don't seem to work. It might get updated later. And the most important one, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with it, DW Pose Estimator, using open pose to spit out your little skeleton -y things. Personally, I enable everything. I think it works better that way. Yeah, it's slower, but so what? We want quality, don't we? So look at that. It's even picking up some interesting finger movement here. I quite like that. And we'll fix the hands using a mesh, uh, mesh grapher. I can't pronounce that stuff uh, later on. So the control nets preprocessors are what extracts the movement. Remember, we're not trying to, de to do vid to vid here. This isn't a uh, filter. We're not trying to do a filter. I could do this in resolves in two seconds. No, 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 no. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to extract movement information to pass it to the case sampler so that it can generate what we told it in the prompt. Let's go and have a look at our prompt. So here I have a simple prompt that's currently disabled. Let's focus on this. Remember, I'm in SD 1.5. There's lots of reasons for this SDXL right now. We have a hotspot uh, hot SDXL, which works quite well, but RAM wise, it's not for me with eight gig VRAM. You can only need 12. In any case, yeah, we got your standard clip text encode. We got your negative clip text encode. It's very, I keep it very basic, very simple. There's no need to go into like those mega long prompt that people charge you for. What a joke. Uh, and that conditioning is going to also impact the image, but not as much as the control net. So once you have the image passed through a preprocessor, you need to give it to a control net. You need to use the advanced control net version that's because that's where you're going to have access to animate diff. Animate diff will not support the standard control net loader. Remember that because that catches everyone by surprise at one point or another when we start with this. Uh, so you pass the control net to the control net apply node and you give it a strength and a start and an end. Evidently, this 101 is the maximum. And for open pose, I find that it works wonder at 101. But when you deal with things like, for example, Zoe depth, Zoe depth, uh, let's have a look. It's I've bypassed it. So let's re-enable it. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. Hey, this is Stefan from the future. So I think another tip that I can teach you immediately is when it comes to Confi UI and rendering, if you have a clean build of your workflow on a recently rebooted computer, you're gonna get these numbers as it progresses. And here you can see that it estimates that it will take two minutes, 13 seconds to process the 16 frames and output them. If for some reason you make a slight modification to your workflow and you restart this and you see that it says, say 51 minutes, sometimes it says 16 hours, 16 days, you know that it's gone over your VRAM. So uh, please be careful with that and don't hesitate to restart the server as many times as you need until such time when the Confi UI team has resolved the various memory issues. Now they're doing a great job and uh, I don't think, uh, you know, we should put pressure on them or anything like this. I'm just saying it's a known problem it's not abnormal, it's not your machine, you're not frying your GPU, your GPU is fine. Also the number of iteration per second, it, it, the larger doesn't mean it's better, okay? Uh, especially when it gets super slow, you'll see 200, 300. That doesn't mean your computer is suddenly going very fast, to the contrary, a smaller number I found tends to be preferable. Okay, it's finally finished. Uh, so what you can see immediately is the application of uh, the Zoe depth has improved the loose clothing that she was wearing. And it's actually consistent. We'll talk about how I managed to get the background consistent. That's the little trade secret I'm gonna reveal to you guys. Uh, but let's have a look at this uh, segmentation on Zoe. So you got two options. You got the regular Zoe depth map, 
which looks like this. And I think that's a little bit too blurry for my taste. So especially like here, you can see these white parts that's going to be picked up by the control net, definitely. You also have Zoe depth anything. And I think this one is superior for many reasons. You can see that the segmentation is much clearer, especially if I mouse over the images. And I think that's definitely the better preprocessor for your control net. Now, if you use depth anything, you need to use the advanced control net model that matches it. Now, I'm not gonna link them all up because there's probably a good half dozen, maybe dozen of them in this uh, workflow, uh, but they're easy to find. They're linked on the GitHub page. And also the thing to remember, because this was a concern of mine, is these files are not updated that often. When they're pushed on Hugging Face, like for example, we have Moon Dream here, I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, these files, once they're released, you know, they're, this one is nine days ago, it's gonna be here for another six months. They're not updated that often. Don't panic about having the right version. You need the right file for the job. So if you have depth anything, you need to use the depth anything control net. That's, that's self-evident, I would say. Uh, the other problem that this highlights is that a slight change in strength, say push it to 0.80, means I have to go and reprocess the whole thing. Now, it's not just cutting the images and so on, because that you could automate by simply saving the output files to something like a folder, and then maybe you could write a custom node that just checks if the file exists. But in reality, the time is spent over here in our friend, the first case sampler. So, this is a good time to talk about upscaling. I want to touch on that real quick before you ask, where's the upscaling? There is an upscaler and I'm going through pixel space and I'll touch on it later, but I'm not using a second case sampler. We're not in SDXL. I don't need to do the step matching stuff. Uh, and I like the idea of a single case sampler. And quite frankly, Topaz is your friend. I know it's expensive, but in terms of upscaling, you're not gonna beat Topaz, but we'll touch on that a little bit later. Let's get back to our control nets. Um, there is a big trend right now, and it's to use uh, line art. So the problem with line art, let me find it. Uh, there it is. So the line art preprocessor, it looks like this when it's all said and done. And yes, I know I have actually removed the background. I'll show you how to do this in a second. This is as good as it gets when it comes to line art preprocessor. Some people really enjoy it. I think it works the best when you have anime characters, right? When you do anime stuff, this kind of lines, the control nets tend to react very well to it and it gives you a very nice result. But when it comes to photorealism, personally, I find that everyone in the community is trending towards using open pose and some type of depth map, whether they're using Zoe, Midas, or Zoe anything, I disabled Midas because it took a little bit too much VRAM yet again, uh, is up to your, let's say, your artistic choice. In terms of how you influence the outcome, again, you want to play with the strength controller first, and of course you have the start and end percent, which function a little bit like what you would see in the case sampler when you try to do, you know, a certain number of steps without, a certain number of step with, and then you stop before it starts denoising again, all on its own. So you give a little bit more freedom to the engine here. That's up to you. How it looks like is completely up to your artistic preference. Personally, I'm well into my photorealism, as you can tell. So I want to make sure that I don't get a weird uh, sort of lines on the background. So how do I do, how do I achieve this even when I have line art enabled? Well, that's Coco segmentation. The Coco segmenter, you know, people make a lot of fuss about it. It's actually pretty straightforward. You pass your original image to the Coco segmenter. The Coco segmenter always works the same way, always. The first thing it does is it tries to identify what's in the front, what's in the back. What's in the front is red. And it's a specific type of red with these numbers in terms of red, green, blue and a little threshold which you should put at one or else you're gonna get little dots in the image and it looks a little bit nasty. So what you do is you then generate a mask 
you grow the mask because you want to capture a little bit more than just the red and you create a new latent. The latent has its width and height matching the original resized image. That The size of that latent, by the way, is completely up to you. If you have a lot of VRAM, go nuts, but remember, you're not on the SDXL, so it's been trained on 512, 512. Some models have been trained on different resolutions, so you have to be careful with that. In this case, I use Epic Realism Natural Sin, I believe, with its own baked-in V. Uh, and by inverting the mask, you can create these composite images. And I use them not in the final output. I use them as references. This helps me understand what is captured, what is not captured. And I can do obviously the same thing for the subject itself. Remember, we're not, repeat, not trying to do a video to video. We're just capturing movement. We're just trying to capture what's in the front, what's in the back. But the Coco segmenting, in my opinion, is how you're going to create the best anime output, the best photorealistic output. You want to cut that subject out of that background. So now we're going to look at the background itself. So here, guys, I wanted to point out this issue I mentioned about the line art. I just want to add more to it. This is what happens if you put a one on the strength of the line art. You can see that it's consistent, but it makes no sense visually. I mean, unless this is some sort of wedding gown that's been shredded to pieces by a rabid dog. Uh, yeah, so I would not recommend line art, even if you Coco segment uh, when using realistic or so-called realistic models. Okay, so to understand what's going on with the background, we need to look at this video. What this is, is basically a Zoe depth map and we can see that the camera moves. Look at the top. Look at how this white here is going to appear there really quick. It's going to flash. And that's because the person who filmed this moved the camera and looked at the wall. The wall was obviously closer, appears in white. So let's look at what that does to your image if you're not careful. If you don't use a control net the way I'm going to show you how to use the control net called tile. Right, so on first inspection, it looks completely stable. It looks completely steady. You know why that is? It's because you've captured 16 frames. So be very careful with that. And you can look at it two ways. You can look at it, look, I only need 16 frames. I'm going to interpolate it. I'm going to slow-mo it. It doesn't matter. You know what? That's what everyone does in this business right now. They use 16 frame. So that way it's relatively stable. They key the person out and they're going to integrate it in something like After Effects or Resolve and they call it jobs done. Personally, I want to go further. I want to go and I have 250 frames, 300 frames, maybe even more, depending on your VRAM, of course. And I want the background to be consistent. Let me show you what that looks like when it becomes inconsistent. So you've captured your motion, you've Coco segmented the line art or whatever, the Z depth, whatever it is you captured, right? And you go over 16 frame. Well, you go from what you just saw to something like this. And this is the typical stuff, uh, AI generated looking thing that quite frankly, there is a sudden visceral reaction to this type of content. Some people think it looks trippy and fun. Most people are already tired of it. Personally, I hate it. Uh, and I understand people's reaction. So we need to find a way to gain control over this background. And by the way, the white bit I was telling you about as the camera moved, there it is. There it is on the side. And the top bit here and the light has been transformed into this weird fire extinguisher, becomes a light again. This is completely unacceptable. This is completely inconsistent. That's what we're trying to avoid. That's poor quality work. When you see videos like this, quite frankly, I mean, it takes two seconds to generate. I find that a little bit disturbing that people enjoy this type of thing. But hey, you know what? Let's move on. Okay, so the background is a thing in itself. The way we get a consistent background is not necessarily through an IP adapter, although you can use this, and I'll show you how to use the IP adapters a bit later, uh, but through what's called the tile control net. You can download that from the control net GitHub, and you'll find the model link to Hugging Face. So here we want to be quite strict. So I put a 080, 01. So that's going to be a very strong application, but it wants an image. So what do we do? Do we just pass it a static image like this? No, 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 no. 
What we're going to do is a little bit more complex and I want to explain to you why I'm doing things the way I do. Uh, like I said here, I don't like surprises. So essentially first we need to resize it. Always make sure you work with the same width and height for your mask, for your source, for your movement, so that you don't confuse things further down the line, especially as when we switch to SDXL, which we will likely will soon, especially with Hotspot working with Animate Diff, we're going to have some issues if we don't obey, uh, obey the SDXL aspect ratios. So what I do is actually I Coco segment this thing. I Coco segment it because I want to see if there's anything in the background that could be considered to be in the foreground. <laughs> do you understand? So I do the exact same thing, grab the mask from color, grow mask, mask blur, invert the mask, and I do a V encode in painting. I use a separate model. I use an Excel model. In this case, you can use whatever you want. I wasn't even bothered to use the SDXL uh, specific prompts. And the idea is it's going to detect if there's anything in the foreground. And in this case, obviously, there is nothing. So it spits out the image right back. Now, there's something I want to touch on really quickly as an aside. This is my next project. I'm kind of excited to talk to you about this. Uh, I'm not satisfied with just getting an image. What I want to do is I want to be able to grab any background and I want to be able to use a case sampler further down the line to overwrite, essentially to do an in-painting uh, using the recently released Fucus in-painting notes for Confi UI. Um, let me show you what they look like. So they just came out. I mean, oh, well, they just came out. <laughs> yeah. it, this is the funny thing about AI is that uh, six days ago is basically prehistory. Uh, but yeah, no, they came out recently. What this will allow you to is to create this sort of in painting and completely mask out uh, certain objects out of the image. So you can see where I'm going with this in my next video. I'll show you how we can use something called Moondream. Moondream is a uh, small language model. If I grab an image and I ask it, uh, tell me, and this is quite blurry, by the way, tell me everything you know about this image. My life depends on it. Uh, yeah, I mean, this trick works every time. It's quite a sad, actually, that we're seeing LLMs going that way, but we have to, yeah, I suppose, follow the rules. Uh, so here we can see that we have a blurred view of a city and so on, and I can ask questions. It's a zero-shot model, so I can say, uh, is it dark, right? And it says no. So you can see where I'm going with this. In my next project, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab just about any background, like, say, the background from this image, we're gonna cut out this gentleman. We're gonna query from Moondream what this image contains, and it's gonna say, well, it's got a swimming pool, it's got people in it, it's it's bright, it's uh, it looks like a vacation, and we're going to feed that to the prompt. Over here, I'm sorry, saying a plain, plain white wall, but we're gonna feed that information to the prompt to actually use the case sampler to replace the Coco segmented image, the foreground that we've obtained over here, with the correct information. And I'm hoping to use IP adapter by Matteo, just brilliant tool, by the way, uh, to generate backgrounds that move. I want to make this thing spin. I want like as if the camera was in POV and move around. Uh, and, and see if I can actually try to match that with the movement of the character. But for the sake of this video, let's skip this bit. That's for the next video. And we're going to use the tile adapter and we're going to implement this. And that's going to give us this consistency that we're after. Let's look at it again so you understand what I'm saying. You see, no artifacts whatsoever. Now, is she well integrated in the picture? Well, you know, there's some shadows we could do better. Uh, I've messed around with the parameters quite a bit for the sake of this video. So in the tutorial, you don't know, you won't have to deal with this. It'll be better quality. Uh, but yeah, that's that's pretty much how I do the background. So let's move on next to the IP adapters. Now, I have a little technique I want to show you. This is not my technique that I invented or anything like that. This is by Matteo. So, how does an IP adapter function? Well, 
basically an IP adapter it eats, if you will, eats a model, spits out a model, you pass it to a second adapter or a third and you can push an image to it and it's going to influence the image. Now some people have called IP adapters some sort of instant LoRa's, I think that's kind of an accurate uh, way to describe it and then it's passed back to the case sampler where it influences the image so if I wanted you know, there's a great video by uh, Latent Vision, I'll, I'll push it into the description where I could put a jellyfish here, right? I could put a spaceship, I could put a plane, I could put whatever I wanted in there. And because I'm using a single case sampler, it integrates all the elements coherently as part of this image. You can see that the face replacement hasn't kicked in yet. Now we're not worried about that, we'll do that later. Same thing for the hands, by the way, don't worry about that. We'll, we'll I'll show you how to fix this later. So basically, the little trick here I want to show you is that we got a problem with the IP adapter here. So when we load the clip vision, you may or may not know this, but clip vision wants 224 by 224 hints. And well, my video right over here, it's vertical. So in an ideal world, I'll segment this in half, pass the top and the bottom, do a composite mask, pass it to two IP adapters and spit it out. Now, does it work? Yes, it works. I'm going to show you the results. Okay, so this is if you didn't do the technique I'm going to show you. You pass a squished image and you hope for the best. Essentially, you take a single frame from your video feed, you pass it, it squishes it by using the prep image for clip vision. It becomes 224 by 224. And well, next thing you know, her top became red for some reason. The clothing is all wrong. Uh, that being said, this little segment here is interesting because you can see that the Zoe depth map did wonder on her shoes. Uh, I know this reminds me a bit of the uh, joke about, have you ever seen the bottom of an avatar shoe? <laughs> You ever wonder what the bottom of an avatar shoe looks like? Yeah, this is what uh, depth uh, depth preprocessors are great for, by the way, because they're going to force those movements that the uh, models haven't been necessarily trained on. And so the little details like that, like the shoes, are going to be a lot more accurate. It's not perfect. I get that. I'm not aiming for perfection here. I'm aiming for a tutorial. But yeah, the long story short is that's the squished version. Now let me show you the full version. Okay, and this is the version that you get if you correctly segment your initial image that you pass to the adapter to match the format of the resulting image. So we're going to stack, if you will, the bottom of this picture and the top of this picture into two different clip vision hints. And now we're going to get much better consistency on the clothing. In fact, it's extremely consistent. I'm very pleased with the results. And thank you, Matteo, again for this great technique. Now we're going to see it has limitations and I'll show you why, but it's a very good way to get that consistency on 16 frames. Okay, so let's have a look at this image resize once again, 488 by 488. So essentially we're taking a frame, frame by frame. We're taking this and we're splitting it in halves. Top, bottom, very simple. We make it 224, 224 because that's what Clip Vision understands. We sharpen it a little bit and we pass it. That's, that's Coco Segmenter crashing because I'm out of VRAM again uh, while doing something else, while recording this. Uh, and we pass it to a top adapter and a bottom adapter. How does the adapter know how to function? Well, very simply, we build a mask, okay? So we do a solid mask, white, black, white on top, black on the bottom, and we then composite this mask pass it to each adapter, and this gives you the correct result uh, when it's all said and done of that consistent clothing that still, by the way, follows your prompt. So that's how we deal with the adapters. Now, I can hear some of you, including myself, saying, yeah, but Stefan, wouldn't it be nice if you could segment anything? Right. If you could, for example, mask out as part of this image, just the character, keep the background, pass the background to an IP adapter, maybe backfill it using that method I talked to you about earlier, or maybe even do it manually, maybe a single static image, right? And, and tell IP adapter to pay attention to it using an attention mask like the one you're looking at here, right? 
Well, this is where I'm kind of stuck. And if Matteo is watching this video, Matteo, dude, I need your help. Because I tried it and I want you to see it. It's an all in the workflow I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you everything, even the errors. Uh, <laughs> and basically, we take the character mask, convert it to an image, split the image top bottom. You can see these nodes are disabled. We convert the image back to a mask and we're saying, yeah, we're going to put in. Ah, wait a minute. Attention mask is already taken. So what I found is you can, of course, take the image and you could say, for example, only pass it a certain part of this character. In fact, if you wanted to get creative, and this is what I've done here, you could take another video. You could pass it through a resize. You Coco segment it. Let's run it quickly so we can look at it. So in this case, we take this image from a rando video. This is what people called uh, segment adapter to, to anything or segment anything. I've heard people talk about that. I've seen people use Unicoder. I've seen people use Coco. You can use whatever you want. There's even entire dedicated set of nodes. So as you can see, I have quite a lot of them here. Uh, Configural Studios got tons of stuff. You can add text. You can do all sorts of things. I think the one that's dedicated to this is either the Inspire or the Impact Pack. Yeah, it's the Impact Pack. And the Impact Pack has tons of segmenting nodes that you can use, including the Ultralytics Detector. Um, and the long story short is basically you end up with a background, a foreground, you take the image, you spit it back out, and instead of passing your original frame, you pass this. So basically you pass a single frame as your foreground. You can even use this background. You can even do this. You can even do a load image, take this image and pass it as the image for your background and throw the lot to IP adapter. You can do anything you want. And what that will do in theory, especially if you only take, for example, this lady here, it will implement it. And you know what? It works. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you the results because um, let's just say that this lady is dressed, uh, is dressed lightly, right? For hot weather. And uh, yeah, the output was out there. So uh, you're not going to see that output. I'm sorry, guys, but it works. So you can segment anything to anything with this workflow. It works a treat. It's really easy to do. You can adjust the weights, of course. Uh, personally, this is what works for me. What works for you might be different. Depends on the context of the video, what you're trying to build and so on and so forth. In fact, let's be even more creative and nail another extra IP adapter, put 10, right? As much as you have RAM, as I put it here, you can put as many of those things. You can mask it further. You could take the output of this, create another mask, and then say, I want this as the background, or I want something else in the image, like a spaceship, like a you know an insect, whatever. Whatever you want, it can be done with this frame, with this workflow. And when I say this workflow, let me be clear, I'm not one of those guys who are trying to sell you their workflow like it's the ultimate workflow. This is very much a learning workflow. Yet again, another disclaimer, okay? So, moving on. So now we have our video. Looks good, but as you saw earlier, the face, not so great. Now there's a joke here somewhere, which I won't make, but uh, okay, so yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not, yeah, no, that's, that's not great. So what do we do for that? Well, you know, you're in pixel space, okay? So you're in pixel space, you can do whatever you want. Think of it as Photoshop. So in this case, I'm going to take Grace Park, the famous actor, and I'm going to use Reactor Face Swap with Retina Face ResNet, G uh, GFP GAN. You can use Codeformer if you prefer. I find that it really depends on the video. I find that GFP GAN gives better results. Sometimes it's Codeformer. You know, use what works for you depending on the context, the profile of the video, and it's going to replace the face. So this is where we talk about hands because the hands are a little bit weird as well. And you probably heard that AI is a lot of trouble with hands. You had a lot of trouble with hands. You can see here, it's not very consistent. So how do we fix this? Well, we use Mesh Graphformer, of course. Let's enable it, shall we? So to do that, I'm using the Fast Muter by RG3. It's really easy. So we're gonna click yes, and we're gonna cue the prompt. 
which I'm going to do off camera because as you can see, I'm out of VRAM. What a surprise. Force laid in. Maximum warp. Punch it. Okay, so it's finished and interestingly it didn't pick up much. In fact, in my previous run that you didn't see uh, because I skipped it simply, um, is it didn't pick up anything. So in this case it only picked up one image, which if you use this in reference, you can figure it has nothing to do with hands. And this is kind of the problem with the mesh graformer in general. And I think this is actually a really important point to, to say. Um, there is too much hype. Every, there's so many white papers. Right? Every day we got three, four white papers and the speed at which Node developers implement them is almost instantaneous. I mean, we're talking about half a day max, uh, sometimes a day to implement an entire white paper. And so that makes Confi UI really cool because you get to play with the latest toys and the latest technology. The challenge is that the people who sometimes make these videos don't test it at all. I've seen people who were talking about nodes that came out a couple hours prior, and unfortunately, you know, I tried them and those nodes didn't work at all. Um, same thing here. Um, I'm not saying that Mesh Graph Former doesn't work, period. It does work, I've used it. However, it's clearly still not 100% there, especially when your latent is very small, like it is in my case, because of the low VRAM. So on an SDXL model, say a hotspot XL, which works with Animate Diff, maybe it would be a different experience with more resolution. Maybe I should first upscale the image, like I'm doing here, into uh, something a little bit more usable, and maybe it would pick it up based on Z depth, or maybe it will pick it up based on B boxes. And the challenge, of course, is understanding what scene you're looking at. This is where human control is still very much important. You need that monitoring. You need that um, manual check and expanding the mask and so on, which, remember, every time you press this button, it's going to re-trigger whatever nodes come later by reading backwards on the graph, because that's how uh, Confi interprets things it reads right to left, not left to right. So, in short, did it do anything? No. <laughs> it's it's really rather that simple. Does it work? Yes. Uh, this video by Scott Deweiler, who has a, an interesting uh, and popular YouTube channel, shows that it does work, that it's not perfect, that the masks are a little bit vague-ish. And you can imagine that re-rendering, of course, uh, these B boxes or the originals, which are even larger, essentially they're, they're just square mask over the hands, right? Um, do take time. And in my case, uh, your mileage may vary, but I had to reboot my computer because while I was recording this, I was also rendering and ShareX, the tool I used to record, uh, failed and the video didn't register. So yeah, very unfortunate. And this is unfortunately the state of where we're at with this stuff. We're on the bleeding edge, and those on the bleeding edge, well, they bleed a lot. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. But what's that then? Let's, uh, let's review what we've done so far, uh, just so we're clear. We load a video, we resize it. If you're using SDXL, you can use the SDXL proportions. There's nodes for that. Then we take each frame, we pass it to a preprocessor to understand what's in the image and control alongside with the prompt. Now there's other tools you can use to sort of, you know, infer more weight to certain prompts or even in some cases, if you want to get really picky, you could even put more weight on parts of the prompts or in the case of prompt traversal, you can even put certain weights on certain prompts at certain times. I mean, it's promptception at this point, especially if you use prompt composer. And it would be this little guy here. And what that note does, it's going to allow you to type in text uh, and assign it different weights 
uh, using a GUI as opposed to you know typing it, and then you can concatenate uh, this into an output, which becomes an input to this. Uh, interest, but that's actually you know more SDXL-ish. I would say it gets even more complex because obviously, as you know, you need to pass clip with and so on and so forth. A couple of tools. So we got first uh, Parsec. Uh, Parsec. I'm not even sure if it was designed for this, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean it probably is actually, which is which is crazy. Uh, it will allow you to pass an audio reference and prompt weighing uh, using splines. Uh, there's another a tool uh, which is the string generator uh, that is definitely not designed for prompting, but it can be used because the output will be just about the same. I mean, ultimately, it's still splines. I really like this one, FrameSync, uh, especially if you want to do some uh, animated music video. This is mostly, I suppose, if you were to use the text prompt as the input and you didn't have so many control nets and so on, unless maybe you want to maybe put in the prompt lights on, lights off, and try to synchronize this with the bits of the music so you could have, you know, this dance music video and, I don't know, some flashing light over here that would switch color uh, to the beat of the music. I've seen people try this, and the reason why you're not seeing more videos of this type is, quite frankly, the render times are surreal. Uh, and I, I really do mean that. Uh, on a 2080 Core i 9 k I believe, uh, you end up with, you know, an hour rendering time for 30 seconds of video. Is it worth it? Uh, you tell me. Uh, it's only going to get better, though. The tools are going to get better and faster and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, I didn't mention it, but evidently you can use a very simple IPA process by just loading an image, preparing it for clip vision and loading the IP adapter, the clip vision itself, and push that. You know, I left the model hanging there, but if you really wanted to, you could just drag this into your IPA chain here as an initial, or you could override this whole thing and just pass a single image and see what happens. Unfortunately, like I told you earlier at the very beginning, it's still very much a numbers game. That's what everyone is reporting right now, that they have some good results one day, terrible results the next, usually leading to having to restart your computer or maybe changing the seed and so on and so forth. So in an environment that demands control like animation, I think it's definitely worth mentioning because if you get frustrated by this, you may even think, hey, I'm watching this, but I feel like this is not the right tool for the job, especially when you start doing background replacement. There are tools that allow you to completely uh, replace the background altogether. It does a pretty good job. The problem is the background says static, completely static and it looks like you've superimposed the video of a lady dancing in, in front of that single photo or it completely unnatural with no reflection, no nothing. So something to keep in mind, the tools are going to need to get better in many respects. Uh, the upscaler, let's finish with this. So let's enable it. Okay, so I'm not going to run it because there's absolutely no point. Uh, you understand how an upscaler works. I know a lot of people like to upscale via, via latent. I don't. I find that the results are far superior if you extract, first of all, uh, the picture to the image space from the latent, you upscale it via maybe an ergan model, a real ergan, or in my case, I use UltraSharp. Uh, it, it can be any model you want. There's dozens of them out there. Just pick the one you enjoy. You then pass it into uh, another upscaler, which will ultimately downscale the image by, in this case, this is 1.2. So what, what you see people do is you see them chaining these things. This is what, by the way, Ultimate SD Upscaler actually does in the back end. And uh, it ultimately ends up in another case sample with the denoise set, usually something like 0 0.5 or something along those lines. As you may know, at one, uh, it is no longer the same image. It's a completely different image that would pop out here. Uh, and at zero, it would be identical with no difference escape, except it's upscaled. So how you want to handle this is up to you. Personally, uh, I'm a, I just use third-party tools. I'm not affiliated with them, but Topaz really does the best job. Uh, I did mention it at the beginning, so we're not going to insist too much on that. So that's how I do it. Evidently, there's a million ways to upscale things in uh, Confi. Maybe you want to use the recently released LDS. I will pronounce this correctly. LD <laughs> SR Upscaler, uh, which works great. 
but in on my machine on the 2080, unfortunately, it's very slow. Oh yeah, one final thing, which you know this video wouldn't be complete without uh, interpolation. So if I enable these nodes, uh, you can have a better look at them. Uh, Rife is essentially an interpolation model. There's a bunch of them. I think most people tend to pick 47 or 49. Which one do you pick? You pick the one based on the results you want. Uh, the way you would do that is simply taking the frames uh, that are coming from the combiner. So you would remove this up and you would push it here instead. And then you would simply uh, decide the multiplier too. And then you could adjust the frame rate. So in this case, we would push it to 48 frames. Uh, is this very useful between you and me? No, <laughs> I'm going to be completely blunt. In terms of our output, does it work? Yes, but any video interpolation tool works the exact same. So again, it's about, do you want to pay the license fee on Topaz to get access to something like the Apollo upscaler? That's up to you. Personally, I find that Rife works great, but I don't understand the use case. You know, if you have enough GPU, VRAM, extra to get a very stable image, uh, sort of iterate over the results rapidly, and you can do it all at 24 per frame per second, why would you set this to 12 and then interpolate it to 24 when you can simply let it run at night? It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but uh, that's, again, that's completely up to you. Whatever works, maybe you just want to do a quick video for, I don't know, your boss, uh, <laughs> your friends, the internet, and quickly interpolate might be a way to do it without waiting too long or waiting overnight even in some cases. So that's about it. That's the kitchen sink. As far as I know, that's every single cool tech out there, buzzwordy tech uh, put together. As you can see, it's really not that complex, but it's about how you use it. It's about creativity. I mean, a TikTok dance, quite frankly, I, I don't find that very appealing at all. Uh, where it gets interesting would be to try to recreate a movie shot by shot, or as I had in a discussion with uh, Pom, uh, the chap who uh, basically runs the Discord server, which by the way, I will show you now. It's a brilliant uh, server. Let me load it up. Um, runs Banodoko, the server. Link in the description. Uh, I think we know we succeeded in our endeavors when we have managed to make someone cry <laughs> by watching something. Uh, so, you know, the emotion needs to be there. But it's it's a brilliant server, so go check it out. Uh, Banodoko, uh, it's some of the best people are in there. Mateo's in there. Uh, you got uh, people that have created some of the best nodes, some of the most common nodes. They're all in there talking about this stuff. And there, there are contests, there's chats, there's meetup. There's one coming up this weekend, so come and join us. And if you have questions, I'll post somewhere in the competition and you can tell me what you think. And if you think I can do something better, tell me. If I've made a mistake, tell me. And until then, I'll see you in the next one.